The UN has tweeted it hopes that it will be able to get aid to Aleppo in the near future, although the uh, the announcement of that uh, new offensive will call that into question. And in an interview today, President Assad has blamed the collapse of the ceasefire on the United States. But uh, despite the breakdown in trust between the two main sponsors of that agreement, there have been fresh talks in New York today involving the US Secretary of State John Kerry and his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov. So what are their prospects of success? The Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson is also in New York at the UN General Assembly. Clearly the situation is very depressing indeed. We've seen uh, more bombing of uh, civilians in Aleppo overnight, almost certainly by the regime or by the Russians th themselves. And uh, yes, I think people would have to say that the, the Kerry Lavrov process is very much in, in jeopardy. But the, I turn it round and say to the cynics and the skeptics, well, what alternative is there? Uh, unless we have a political process of some kind, I don't think that you get, you've got any chance of getting a ceasefire. And you certainly won't get a ceasefire unless you've got some commitment by the puppeteers in this proxy war that they want a political process. So what is the answer to Boris Johnson's question? What is the alternative to the current process? Well, Charles Lister is a fellow of the Middle East Institute, and he was an advisor to the Geneva peace talks on Syria earlier this year. I think the biggest issue here is that with the United States policy as it currently stands is, is hoping that uh, various unreliable actors will suddenly become reliable, will suddenly become supportive of a political process that they have made explicitly clear in public they are not supportive of. By that you mean the Russians or others? Uh, specifically the Russians in this case, yes. I mean the United States has clearly thrown all of its cards in with negotiations with the Russian government here and in many respects it's actually sidelined the various other uh, more important stakeholders in terms of de determining uh, developments on the ground. And earlier this year and, and late 2015, we saw a, a political process start to develop with regards to Syria that involved roughly 15 government stakeholders who had a role in the conflict. And as complicated and as messy as a process as that might have been, it was of intrinsic value to have governments like Saudi Arabia and Iran and a variety of other governments, including the, the UK and France and, and, and others, around the table at the same time. In a sense, what might have been agreed around that table had that much more of a potential to be implemented on the ground than something negotiated in co total isolation from those broader dynamics between the United States and Russia. So what should the US administration do? Well, if you want my honest opinion, the, the US administration needs to do exactly what it has made very clear it does not want to do, which is actually to, A, to enforce an agreement like this with actual consequences for violating a ceasefire. Um, what and, sort uh, of consequences? The consequences in that respect, I think, can only be military, unfortunately. I mean, this is a sensitive subject in the West these days, given history with Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and elsewhere. I mean, I'm certainly not advocating an invasion. I think what, what I do have on my mind here is very highly limited, targeted, what are called punitive strikes in response to particularly flagrant abuses of a ceasefire agreement. So theoretically speaking, if uh, the Assad regime were to bomb a hospital or an aid convoy on one night, then the United States the following night at three o'clock in the morning would take out with a cruise missile, so no involvement of jets in the air, um, a, an airstrip somewhere in Syria um, with the explicit intention of not killing any Syrian soldiers or taking any lives, but sending a serious political message to Damascus that it can no longer get away with violating international agreements like this. As you say, this is something that the Obama administration has made it very clear is not part of its planning. Do you get any sense at all there in Washington that the events of the last week are making some of people in positions of power think again? Well, listen, we're in a funny situation here in Washington whereby I actually think that the White House and Obama's immediate advisers are, as you say, uh, very much against considering any kind of military action in Syria for whatever purpose other than fighting against terrorism. Um, but the funny situation is um, a significant majority of people working on the Syrian issue on the State Department have already recommended exactly what I just uh, laid out um, as, the, as that really 
really the only way forward for actually pushing towards some kind of sustainable ceasefire and then a political process in Syria. Um, the intelligence community more often than not takes a very similar line, as do most people in the Department of Defense. So we're in a strange situation whereby uh, most arms of the government and most people working on this issue on a day-to-day -day basis know that more needs to be done. But we have people in the White House who consistently refuse to do that. So at the moment, we're almost in a complete deadlock here in Washington. That was Charles Lister. Well, let's check in 